Tamika, is every day a writing day for you? Actually, no. It's funny because um, most it, most writers will say you have to write every day, you have to write every day. And um, for a time I used to do that, it, but it was journal writing, everyday journal writing, everyday journal writing. And then I would be inspired and I'd write a project, a screenplay, a poem, whatever it, it is. But I came to a place where there were so many other things going on, I knew I had to experience life and um, journaling became a different thing. It was more like where I would just vent. And I got to a really peaceful place in my life where I didn't want to vent in my journal anymore. So I stopped writing in my journal, which when I think about it sometimes and I look at my journal, I go, well, I kind of regret doing that because there was also kernels of just what was happening in my life, you know, sort of a chronicling of my life. But um, I really admire writers who literally commit to write every day. If I were to give someone advice, I would definitely tell them to do that. Um, but I also know that everybody has a different process. And when I'm inspired, literally, it just all comes out. So like even my first screenplay, I thought about it for two or three months. And then literally, I wrote it in like three weeks. So when that happens, when I'm inspired like that, and I've been literally thinking about a project and sort of letting it marinate, it just all comes out. So I, I say everybody has a different process, but I would probably have a lot more product if I just committed to write something every day. It could be a poem, it could be anything. I think that's just really wonderful to do, but I have so many different interests that <laughs> writing is one of them. So yeah. So when you do write, what does a writing day look like? Uh, I'd say in my most prolific time, a writing day is literally getting up in a very disciplined way and writing for four or five hours or more straight. I would get up and consistently go to coffee shops and maybe show up around 10 or 11 a.m. And I'd start writing, you know, I'd, you know, mess around on Facebook or whatever. And then after I'd procrastinated for 30 or 40 minutes, I'd be like, okay, you got to get to it now. And so then I would write for about four or five, six hours, maybe take a break, have some lunch. And then I'd write again until like late in the, in the evening. And then I'd go to the gym, go home and do it all over again. And there were like very specific coffee houses around LA and there would just be the usual suspects. So you'd see other writers, screenwriters, you'd also see like maybe students, but mostly after a while you'd see the same kind of screenwriters. Um, there was one guy who was a, a storyboard artist and he was getting into the whole digital thing. And so he would be there every night doing his storyboard art digitally or whatever. And we would all know, we'd like all know each other. So we'd have to sometimes find different, uh, different coffee shops because it would become slightly more social. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, I don't want anyone to talk to me right now because I really just want to focus. And you weren't distracted? Because I just tried to go to a coffee shop to try this whole and couldn't do it. There was no way. <laughs> I'm too, I, there were too many things I was watching. Well, um, I wasn't distracted because I get distracted at home because there's too many things that I can do at home. If I'm in an environment where everyone's really just doing their work and writing, it's hard for me to be distracted. I'd say the thing that would sometimes distract me is if they were playing um, 80s music all the time, like I'd be like, okay, can they really just finish with this? Because I'm going to sing to every song. I can't do this. Please just stop playing all the 80s. I'm like, I love karaoke. So I would, I'd be like, okay, Cinefil, my blood runs. <laughs> I'm like, okay, oh my God, now they're playing Pat Benatar. Oh my God, now they're playing. And I would sing to all of them. So I was like, no, I, I need you guys to finish that. Or I'd put in my earphones and, you know, zone out on some classical music or something that was more like background music as opposed to something that I would literally want to like sing or move to. <laughs> so it sounds like the energy of being out really kind of invigorates you. It does, mm -hmm. it does. And I, and I will say there is a collective consciousness of work focus. So if you have four or five people who are really writing in an environment and you know they're screenwriters and you know that that's what they're doing, you're gonna kind of feel compelled, I feel, or at least I did, I felt compelled to really write. You know, and I'd, I'd say, okay, you need to do at least 10 pages a day, you know. And 10 pages seems like a lot, but I would take the pressure off of myself by saying, they can suck, but you still need to do 10 pages a day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Now, is a lot of this journaling sort of like artist pages, sort of the artist way, where you're just like getting out all this stuff that's swirling in your head? Um, I would say it is kind of stream of consciousness, maybe more so stream of consciousness for the journaling. When I was uh, going to the coffee shops, I wouldn't journal, I would just do my screenwriting work. So that's when I was saying I would do 10 pages a day. When I'm journaling, it's just stream of consciousness. And um, now I do it at the end of the year. So my, I guess some people would consider boring process is I will like, you know, do some prayer and meditation or whatever, and I will literally write for like a day and a half. So I'll write like 30 or 40 stream of consciousness pages about everything that happened that impacted me during the year. So it's literally like a 30, 40 page journal that happens over the course of a day and a half. And then do you burn it? Do you keep it? I know you had your journal taken. And I, 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 did, are there any still feelings about that? Like someone might read this? Because you no, talked about that. No, no. Yeah. The only time I've ever burned my journal was when I, I had a boyfriend who read it and I was just being dramatic. And I was like, you read it, now I have to burn it. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, you no. know. Okay. It was I, just for theatrics. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. How many years have you been writing screenplays? I have been writing screenplays. Does that include television scripts? Because I think my very first one, I tried to write um, a Cosby Show episode when I was in college. So that was probably 25 years or no, <laughs> something like that. 20 to 25 years ago, I think. And that was my first script. Someone gave me like a spec Cosby sh script. And I was like, oh, I think I can, I can do this. I love that show, I think I can do this. So I literally just sort of used it as the format. Back then there was no final draft, none of that stuff. You just had to figure it out, right? So um, back then, I'm making myself seem so old. <laughs> so um, I just like did the format and I did a Cosby script and I think it was about, um, oh gosh, it was like a spelling bee script. Like Rudy wanted to win the spelling bee or something like that. So about between 20 and 25 years, something like that, maybe. Okay. And had you always wanted to write? Because it sounds like you were journaling before that. But so you went to school in the DC area? I went to American University and I also took classes at Howard. Okay. Yeah. And was that part of the plan? Like you knew that then you were coming to LA or? No, I never expected to end up in LA. I, was, I actually started out as a journalist. And I was doing um, journalism. I was a youth correspondent in Richmond, Virginia, which is where I'm from. And I wrote some news stories. I went to a couple of uh, journalism workshops uh, over the summer, one in Arizona and all this other stuff. So I was really on that path. But then when I got to school, I realized that in order to be a journalist, because I still, I loved writing. I was writing, when I was younger, I would write really bad rhyming couplet poems romantic, unrequited love, because I used to read a lot of Harlequin romance novels and silhouette novels. When I was a kid, I would read these things. <laughs> and so all of my bad poetry <laughs> was like rhyming couplets. And so I did that for a long time. And then, um, so I've always been writing. And they told me that in order, because I wanted to f write features, like feature articles, the fun stuff, the creative stuff. And they were like, oh no, you don't really get to do that until you've sort of paid your dues by like writing about politics and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, I am so not interested in that. It would be different today. Today politics is exciting and it's opinionated and we're all into it. But back then it was boring. They were like, you have to go to Congress and take notes about that. And I was just like, yeah, I, I'm good. I'm gonna take a creative writing class and kind of go down that path. Okay. And so I started acting. That's how, so that's, that was the crossover, acting and then playwriting, then script writing. It sort of went in that, in that uh, way. In that order? Yeah, in that order. Thank you, in that order. That's the way I wanted to say that. <laughs> so what does writing mean to you? Because obviously it's been in you a long time, whether it's the poems or wanting to be a journalist. But it sounds like there's something that, do you feel almost you express yourself in a totally different way once you're putting the pen to the page or keyboard? Yes, and I would say that's a great way to ask that question. 
if I express myself in a totally different way because even when I write emails, some of my, um, my girlfriends and some of my boyfriends in the past would be like, oh yeah, she writes extremely dense emails. <laughs> <laughs> Not in all caps, though, right? Not oh, in good. all okay. caps. Okay. They're like, seriously? <laughs> I'm like, I'm a writer. What do you want from me? I feel like I express myself um, just uh, more clearly, and there's no reading between the lines. When I write it in an email, it's exactly what it is that I want to say, right? I feel mm -hmm. like I can say everything, and there's nothing left out when I write an email. So I feel that way sometimes when I'm writing, definitely in my journal. And um, for other things like more creative endeavors like um, screenwriting, it's just the characters speak through me and that's like what's amazing and fun because I never know what they're going to say or what they're going to do. Sometimes I'll pull stuff from people that I know and put them in the character's mouth, that kind of thing. You know, you're never safe around a writer. They're always taking notes. <laughs> so, you know, you just say, hey, everything's fair game. Anything you say may end up in a script. I won't assign it to you, but <laughs> it may end up in a script. So um, I just think in that way, it's just fun to have the characters really like come through you and live through you. And I think thematically is, is what's connected to you. Like there's always something that is connected to you in some spiritual or, or experiential way. But it's a surprise when these characters do stuff that maybe you didn't expect them to do or they say something you didn't expect them to say. And that, that's really fun. Is writing another way of allowing yourself to be honest? Because I know for women, we have to be very careful in our tone, and sometimes we're, we're groomed to like end things in a question sometimes. I know people would debate me on that, but we have to be careful that we don't. Do you think with writing, it's easy to just be honest and say it, and there's no like, we don't assign judgment to it? Uh, yes, I would say when you're really being authentic as a writer, then definitely it's a way of being honest and true. And I think um, people really respond to authenticity and they know when you're not being authentic. Um, when I wrote my first screenplay, my brother, who's an, an incredible writer, like he, he started writing screenplays and now he's a novelist. And I actually tried to get him to write my very first screenplay, Jar by the Door. I had written a treatment for it and he was like, oh, this is great, this could be a really good script. No, I'm not gonna write it for you. Learn how to write, <laughs> write it yourself. I was like, but you do it already. He was like, nope, you have to do it. So the reason I brought him up was he was the first person to read my very first uh, draft. And he read it and he was like, this is really great. It's almost there, but there's stuff in it that is not real. It's not authentic. And you're just kind of not, you're sort of, touching at some stuff, but you're dancing around it. And he's like, you really have to take the gloves off and be real with your characters and let them talk in a real way. Um, and he was specifically talking about the lead character, which was slightly fashioned after me. And he was like, that's not a real person. <laughs> he was like, maybe it's too close to you, but you have to let go of that and just let it be authentic how that person would respond, even yourself. You've made her too nice and too good and too, and I was like, but that is me. And he was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Can we get a little truth in here? <laughs> and so I rewrote it with his notes. And it's like a much better script because I let the characters really be human and real and messy and all that stuff, you know. And is it hard to let a protagonist have faults? Because we, we don't want to judge them, but it's just part of being human. I think when I first started writing scripts, it, it was, once I learned that lesson from my brother, I really understood that the, the characters are more interesting and they're more, um, people can relate to them more, so they're more relatable when they do have faults, because we all do, and when we actually show those faults, it sort of, it balances everything out, you know, because there's something that people can relate to. And, you know, any character that has faults, I mean, it's more, I think we do it more these days. Um, than we did before. Yeah. So like you might have a, a, vil a villain who has some really nice qualities or you have the protagonist who has some really just awful qualities. We still root for him and we still like him. We're like, well, you know, everybody has their stuff, right. even this person. Yeah, that's a good point. I think in the 80s, we, we had more of a, like the thing you're pretty in pink or something like yes. the character, there wasn't anything really that she did that was awful. No. We no. wanted her to win, but she didn't really have a dark side. Not yeah. really, no. We still liked her, though. <laughs> yeah, we, we did. did. The guy. Yeah. <laughs>
and ducky. I mean, yeah, hey, I know. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Tamika, did you sell the first screenplay that you wrote? Uh, I did, and I would use sell loosely. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, it's called Jar by the Door, and like, I was really, really um, grateful that I was validated right away. Most screenwriters don't really get that validation. They have to sort of get it from their family or their friends or a teacher or someone, but that kind of validation came really quickly for me. I, um, I won a contest, and it was like $10,000, and it helped move me to L.A., and... I um, optioned the script two or three times, so it was kind of keeping me um, alive. You know, it's like $5,000 yeah. for each option, which was a lot a few years ago. And, <laughs> and so um, that was amazing. And then I actually sold the script, in quotes, I sold the script for six figures. And um, yeah, there's no other way to put it. <laughs> the check wasn't good. <laughs> It's like the check was, uh, it was a rubber check. And it was really, it was kind of devastating because I had worked with these people for about three or four years. They had literally optioned the script twice, two or three times before. And so I'd probably already made about 15 to 20 grand from this company. So of course there was no reason for us to think right. that this check wouldn't be good. And um, so we got the check. My manager was like, okay, just hold on it to it for a day or two. You know, it's just, just to be sure, blah, blah, blah. They said, hold on it. They want to make sure the money is in there. And then a day became a week. And then a week became two weeks. And I was like, well, what's going on? And he's like, I'm not sure, but I'm not sure if that check is going to clear. They're having some issues with their financier or whatever. And I was like, oh my God, you're kidding me. Of course, I had already spent this money in my mind. And it was the perfect scenario. I was going to get to direct it. I was going to get a producer credit. It was going to change my life. <laughs> and then uh, it just never, it just never cleared. And um, I thought that, you know, if someone asked me today, if they say, well, would you change that? I would say no, because it sort of pushed me into a whole other amazing thing that I created. So after that, I just did a lot of soul searching. And I thought, well, is this what it, is it this all I'm supposed to be doing with my life? Trying to sell my script, trying to do this. There's got to be more to it. So I started to um, uh, mentor and teach, and I totally fell in love with uh, demystifying the filmmaking process for kids. And so someone asked me, if you could do anything, what would you do? And I said, aside from filmmaking, I grant uh, wishes to the kids in the Make a Wish Foundation because I, I really admired. Uh, that organization. So I thought, hey, maybe I could get, can combine these two things. And I created Make a Film Foundation, which grants film wishes to kids who have serious or life threatening medical conditions. And this never would have happened if I hadn't, you know, if that check wasn't bad and I ch cashed that check. I would have had a whole different color to my career. But I mean, I, I've done so much and created so many films with these kids and I mean it's just I wouldn't change it so I mean I just wouldn't change it so um, it, just, it was just a lesson and this is what you think you want and every you know just because it seems like it's a bad thing it doesn't necessarily mean that it is it maybe it's just sending you in another direction that you're that is really your true calling and what you're meant to do I want to know how long did you feel bad for and when did the idea pop in? Um, how long did that? Let's see, so that happened right around 2000. Um, I felt bad for about, I'd say about a year, year and a half. Okay. And then I actually, uh, I was doing some self-empowerment, self-awareness program called Landmark or something. Oh yeah, I've heard of that. And, it used and, to be Est. Yeah. Yes, and, and they actually gave me some really incredible tools to, um, it just sort of helped me to redefine what possibility is and redefine what I was able to create at any moment in my life. And so, um, and then they had this uh, class where you create a project and I thought, this would be the perfect class to kind of create this, uh, this project out of. And so that's kind of how that uh, evolved. And, um, and it just, it changed my life, it changed my world and it changed a lot of my perspective. I mean, even to this day, creating Make a Film Foundation, even like right now today, mm -hmm. it has affected what I'm doing. I, I just uh, got a job, another, a job that I love. If I hadn't created Make a Film Foundation, I would not have the, the skills and everything else 
for this job that I'm doing right now. Nice. How much do you think having that like downtime, because you know how a lot of especially though, get yourself back up there and dust yourself off and don't feel bad. This is Hollywood. But sometimes I think people need that like down period. And if you have to go there and feel bad, I think it's like you should allow yourself. Do you think that that really helped spark that idea? Yeah, I think it's very important for you to allow yourself to feel how you need to feel. Um, I think you should put an expiration date on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh-huh, I guess on that one. So I think there should definitely be like, you know, <laughs> right. even if you have to do it a little bit every day, okay, I've got 15 minutes to think about what happened, and then I'm gonna do something creative and amazing right. <laughs> that supports who I really am. Right, okay. don't live there. Right, right. you can't that. live there. So it's like you can have the feelings, but not let the feelings have you. Right. And I think it's important because a lot of the times those feelings are what inspire or spawn some of our most creative work. I mean, our characters go through stuff and we want to see that. I mean, how are you going to really authentically write about that or portray that if you don't allow yourself to experience it as well? And it does. I mean, you know, let's look at Alanis Morissette, the screaming, crying Canadian girl. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, but it was like a heartbreak that maybe that really blew her career up right and she allowed herself to she just poured all that stuff into her creative uh, music and and gave it to the world yeah. and I think sometimes we have to do that can we go back for a moment to jar by the door and you started writing it I think you showed it to some family members yes I showed it to my brother and he was like no you have to write it yourself and I did and then he gave me some feedback and I implemented all of his notes even though they were prickly <laughs> uh, I was prickled, but Thanks, I bro. still <laughs> I uh, implemented all of his notes, and uh, he read it again. He like was like thumbs up. He loved it, but then I didn't really know what to do with it. So he was like, "Well, why don't you just try submitting it to you know some places? You know, there wasn't really the whole go online type of thing happening at the same level as it is now." What year was this? It was uh, ninety. 798, oh, right yes. around there. So we so were AOL just, was, yeah. It was all AOL. <laughs> it's all about the AOL. <laughs> it's just, okay. just a spam box now. <laughs> but, you right. know. Right. Um, so you had your dial up. Yeah, right. So it. that's what we were doing. And um, so I just did some research and I found out about like the Sundance Screenwriting Lab and um, I submitted it to a few contests um, like the Nichols Fellowship and um, I got like incredible feedback, right? It was really great. I was a finalist for Sundance. This is like right off the bat. I didn't even know wow. what Sundance was. I I did this stuff in a way that was so naive. <laughs> it's like I was just doing it. I didn't know anything. I would like send stuff out to Hollywood. I had no agent, no manager. I didn't even know what that stuff was or how you get one or even that I needed one. I would just blindly, you know how they say now, no, uh, we don't accept unsolicited material and all that. I would just send stuff, <laughs> send stuff out. But it actually worked for me. I ended up getting incredible responses and feedback and I started setting up meetings. This is after, like I did win one of those contests. I won the Gordon Parks Independent Film Award and it had like this huge prize, like $10,000. And I used that to eventually to move to LA. But, because, but I had um, made all these connections just completely out of the blue because I didn't know any better. I had made all these connections. I would write to people, this, oh my God, yes. We would type. I would type the letters on <laughs> like a word processor. It oh, was wow. Crazy. Like a selector. Word processor, yes. yeah. <laughs> and then I would send the letters out. And so I'd get, I, like, I have actual real letters of like responses from people. And, um, you know, of course, there's the, the big, huge pile of rejection letters, but I actually had a pretty significant pile of letters where people responded to me. And, and it was weird. I'm like, when I think about it now, I'm like, oh, they don't do that anymore. <laughs> but back then, it was really kind of, you know, I thought that's how you did it. You did it yourself. And um, so I would say, yeah, getting back to that actually to a certain degree is kind of where my head is. And what I would say to screenwriters, it's like, even when you get a manager or something like that, you still have to be in control of your career. You still have to do stuff, network, meet people, and all that kind of stuff, because you're literally laying a foundation that is gonna pay off. I had, you know, I've had meetings with people from those blind letters that I, queries that I sent out after I won the uh, Gordon Parks and I had was like a finalist in Sundance. I mean, I could put something in the letters like, yeah. oh, my script was a Sundance finalist or whatever, but I didn't have much more. It was the only script I had written, you know? 
but um, it was something. And so these people would meet with me. So when I came out to LA, I had like 10 or 15 meetings set up with people just from just, you know, I didn't know any better. <laughs> I didn't have a manager, no agent, nothing. Yeah. And so do you attribute that to, well, no, what do you attribute that to aside from talent? What, what, what else? Because do you think because you weren't afraid, you just were like, I'm going to do this. I think a lot of people overthink it. I didn't know any better. You didn't know <laughs> It's that simple. Okay. I uh -huh. didn't know that I wasn't supposed to do it, right? right? So it's like, because I didn't know any better, I probably just bumbled my way into some success. <laughs> you know, I wasn't. But you know what? Let's, let's take that back to what you said. I wasn't afraid because I didn't know that I should be afraid. So it's completely connected to what you just said. If I had known that you're not supposed to do it that way, right. then I wouldn't have. But I didn't know, you know, I didn't know that you're supposed to have a manager and you can't submit unsolicited material and this and that. And I just didn't know. I just did it because I didn't have any other way. I didn't know how, how else are you going to do it? You just look in that big book, the Hollywood, that's what it was. Remember the Hollywood Creative Directory? You guys remember that? Uh, it was a big of. old thick book. They, it's online now. Okay. But it was like $65 and it literally listed yes. all the okay. managers, mm -hmm. the producers, the production companies. So someone gave me a tip, I don't remember who, and they were like, you should get this book and you should just uh, you send your letters out to any production company or producers or managers in here. So that's what I did. I just went through it wow. and I looked and see, you know, okay, who likes, um, is there anybody here who does any kind of um, uh, uh, diverse material or is there anybody here who does like ensemble indie work, you know, that kind of stuff. So I ended up sending it to places like the shooting gallery. Remember the shooting gallery? That was Sling Blade back in the day. Okay. <laughs> Do you remember uh, yeah. uh, Billy Bob Thornton's Oh yeah, Blade? oh absolutely. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think they were, he was discovered through the shooting gallery and so there's like these little back then, oh, I wish we had that now, but they had all these little baby independent companies that would do really great stuff. You know, I guess they went bankrupt, but, <laughs> but I wish they would do it again. Yeah, you know, I really interesting stuff, stuff, right? That, that, was, that was a great film. But think about today, so 2016, if you were still in that same spot because you were still back on the East Coast at yes. that time, yeah. what would you do? Knowing that now you can look anybody up by just doing a Google search for the most part or getting IMDb Pro and, and, and knowing that it's so saturated, but you still have this burning desire, you still have talent. Right. What would you do? So do you mean what would I do if I had written this script yeah. then? Yeah. To get it out and you wanted to come to LA and set up meetings. I think um, because I know so many people who are in the business and so I guess it would be, is it me now knowing the people that I know or is it me then not knowing anyone? You know, because mm -hmm. that's a different, because I would just, there's actors that I know, there's writers, producers, I would get, and maybe I'd do it the same way anyway, whether I knew them or not. I'd just find someone who did it right. and, or who was in some way in the business and just ask their advice. What do you think I should do? Is there some, can, do, can you recommend someone to, to read it? Or right. I, I also probably, because I did this back then, again, because I didn't know any better, but I still do this now. I would create my own readings. So I had a lot of, um, friends anyway, you know, because New York was like that. Not, LA is kind of like that, but New York, it's a different kind of, um, uh, how, I don't want to say posse, but friendship pool. Like yeah, you, I've you're heard connected that. to yeah. people. And so when you do a reading or something like that, you get people to come to your reading and it's like a party and that kind of thing. And I did a little bit of that out here trying to establish that same dynamic. But that really yielded a lot of results when you literally just do a reading of your work. People come, they see it, they, they're like, wow, that was great. And then those people talk to people they know, and it just sort of is a snowball effect. So I would say always, if you're writing or anything like that, you still are in control of putting your stuff out there in some way, shape, or form. And it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. It doesn't have to cost anything. So you say almost do like, hey, let's have a wine and cheese at my place and come and read yes. my script. Kind of. I take it a step further, like, uh, and uh, I wrote a script with my, my best friend, sort of like a uh, kind of a road trip girly movie, whatever, but it was really funny, right? So we um, got some of the people that we knew. We told everybody we were going to do this reading. We cooked, like we cooked 
like real food. And we were like, it's going to be food and drink. And we sort of supplied everything. And it was like packed. It was like literally 150, 200 people because, and then we started like making that a thing. So people would want, and you know, of course, your stuff has to be at least interesting. <laughs> so well, the food and wine. Or the food, right? Yeah. So, so it would be those two things. <laughs> and so um, the people would come and be like a big party. You'd meet people, you'd have fun, the work is cool, you can talk about that. And then literally, we'd have to kick people out, you know, or we'd have it at a theater and they'd be like, okay, you guys have to, you know, because there's food, there's wine, there's creative stuff happening. and. In LA, especially, we have to create these things for ourselves because it's not as easy to do as it is in New York. Here, people are all over the place, and creating a creative group is like it's not just like a creative thing that you need to feed yourself creatively, it's spiritual, you know, it's like a spiritual food, um, and you know fellowship it's like all of that happening at once and people will come to experience that you know let's suppose 2016 uh, and you're you're back on the East Coast instead of just blindly submitting to contest you would try to create a group of people and and emulate what you just said yes. where... we would definitely just create the work and you know we'd share the work all of that kind of stuff I mean these days now you can put pieces of it you can put pieces of it online, you know what I mean? You can have video proof of what you did right. that was amazing. You know, there's so many different ways and that's an excellent way to meet new actors um, because uh, we, we did a reading out here uh, recently of one of my screenplays and I did the same exact thing. A theater let us, you, they let us use a theater for free and um, I cooked and all that kind of stuff. And um, But I actually uh, went on to uh, Actors Access or whatever so that I could cast it with real actors. And they were amazing. They came in, they auditioned, they did the whole thing for a reading. Wow. <laughs> I mean, it was incredible. And they were really good. Like amazing actors, amazing people. It was like a great night. And everyone enjoyed themselves. So when you do that, if you do it again, people come. Because they, not even just seeing the work. Again, it's fellowship, it's, wow. you know, meeting people, meeting new talent. You know, other writers, other producers, directors, actors. We have to do more of that in LA. Yeah, because we're in our cars. Little, yes. We're in our cars our all day. Cars, yeah. our little pockets. We never see anyone. Right. Or the phone is right here. Yeah. Don't look up. It's a yeah. whole different thing when you're connecting on that other level. Yeah. I kind of miss the 90s. It was, yeah. yeah. And of course, this, is, this as a writer, my gosh, how it's what better way, you know? Not only do you get to see your work, in the mouths of real actors doing all kinds of things, what works, what doesn't, all that. But you have people who are going to talk to you about how they felt and this scene made me feel this way or I thought this way about that scene. And that is just, that's like incredible for you. It's like, right. you know, gold. Right. And it's a human connection. And it's a human yeah. connection. And they're really giving you what they felt or thought. Well, I know we've kept it fairly positive and upbeat, but I'm just wondering, is there anything about the screenwriting process that you hate? Yes. Okay. The beginning. <laughs> really, the beginning. Okay. <laughs> what, what is it about the beginning? I, you know what? The process of just starting to write is so uh, challenging that I often come up with the title first. It's so backwards. Like, I don't know any screenwriter who, they're like, like literally, I've written a whole screenplay from a title that inspired me. There was a, a title called uh, The Big Empty. A friend of mine had a song called The Big Empty, and I was like, that's a great title for a script, The Big Empty. So I literally wrote The Big Empty and thought, okay, what's it going to be about? And then I came up with the whole script for what this was going to be about. <laughs> so I think it's just getting started. I'm not someone who does, even, even though my very first successful screenplay was almost like doing an outline, it was like a stream of consciousness treatment that I wrote. And then I realized after writing like 20 or 30 pages, you should just write the script. You're, it's right here. You should just write the script. But that's because I had been marinating on it for so long. I could just do that. But when it comes to outlines, which is a process that a lot of script writers do, and I'm still trying to figure out how to do that. I really admire people who really know how to outline 
and write their scripts from there. Things are just a little bit more organic for, for me. But I can write like a beginning, a middle, and an end, but it's usually about two or three pages of stuff and a character breakdown. Um, I think I just went on a tangent. What was your actual question? Well, so you're saying that what you hate most is starting. I, you right. know, I'm thinking of how some people, let's take roommates, some are messy, some are neat. Do you think that there's just some people that they get to the, the, the final destination the same way, but they just have their own way of doing it, whereas a teacher might look at it and say, oh, that's bad, that's wrong, but it still works out? Yeah. Um, hmm. Because it sounds like you don't like to do the outlining, but you still get to the end result. I don't like to do the outlining. I still get result. it done, but I, feel, I often feel like if I had the, uh, I don't even know what it is, <laughs> whatever it is that that screenwriter has that makes them sit down and discipline do the outline, yeah. I think that my job might be a little bit easier but I'm just saying that because it seems like that works really well hmm. it's like the studio way of doing things too like TV you have to give an outline and then you write the script and uh, oh I'll have to tell you a funny story about that so um, I was in the the Walt Disney Fellowship and um, I was in the uh, screenwriting uh, version of it they don't have the screenwriting arm anymore they just have the TV arm believe it or not I've been trying to get them to get the other one back but I wrote a, a television script for them and um, uh, at the time, it was the practice, and uh, my wife and kids were the TV shows that were on television that I wanted to write for. And um, they were like, okay, so you have to pitch us your story, do an outline, once we like the story, and then write the script, right? So I pitched them the story, they liked it, right? And I was just like, what's this outline thing? I don't know what this is. I literally went and I wrote the script, then I wrote the outline, from the script. Oh wow, okay. And then I gave them the outline and they're like, this is great. They made a couple of tweaks for the outline. So I implemented the tweaks in the outline and then I just went and implemented the tweaks in the script. <laughs> but the script was already done. <laughs> so it was just like a formality. It almost. was a formality because they, that's yeah. the way that they had to do it. We had right. to do it that way, but it didn't make organic sense to my process. Sure. Which is weird, but you know. Have you had people try to rein you in and make you do it that way? Because it sounds like it's it's still working though. That that that's just what you I do. I definitely have, and when I when I have to, I will, but it's very uncomfortable. I feel like my organic process is just different. I understand why it works for people, and I understand why they do it, but my body, my brain just goes, just write it. It's right here. Just write it. What is this outline stuff? <laughs> Right. You're wasting time. Write the script. <laughs> some people make their bed every morning, and some people, 20 years have gone by, never once. Right. So, and they still make it home again. Right? That's, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. You know? So, do, do you find yourself squirming to get out of starting and then oh, yeah. finding yeah, excuses? Clean house, uh -huh. and spring, spring cleaning, and. Right. You know, reading books that I've have been on the shelf for years. Like, I'm going to read this book. I've been planning to read it for 10 years. I'm, I'm going to read it now. And I'm like, really? Really? You need to be writing. <laughs> what are you doing? But, um, yeah, you do everything to get out of it. And But once I'm in there, mm -hmm. you know, that's the crazy part. It's like, once you're in there, you're in there. Just get in there. But that's easier said than done. But what do you think it is then that, that when you've like had enough and you're like, you know what, I, I'm procrastinating. Well, how do you get yourself in there? Well, this is a saying that I've said to my friends, procrastination with writing, procrastination is part of the process. And I truly believe that because I think that just like birthing a baby, you know, there's stuff going on while you're procrastinating. It's not like you're just not doing anything. You're, that's why the writing process, I think, is so kind of mystical in a way. Yeah. Because there is stuff happening. If you go take a walk on a beach or you're just hanging out or whatever, you are procrastinating, but you're not because there's two things happening. It's like a parallel thing going on. Yeah. On the surface, it looks like you're doing this, but your brain and your body, all this stuff is happening that is gonna be useful for you when you start writing. It's just preparing you, gearing you up to write, that's all it's doing. And I've realized that, so I really kinda, you know, I, I lighten up on myself about it because I believe that procrastination is, I call it procrastination, but procrastination in the way that we're talking about is part of the process. How do you write a great scene? 
Hmm. How do I write a great scene? Well, usually uh, I jump in in the middle of the scene, so it's sort of like the scene doesn't necessarily begin from an organic place. Maybe when I enter the scene, they're already there, right? And then um, whatever it is that's happening, uh, I just let it organically play out, and then I go back and sort of tweak it for language and authentic conflict, if that okay. makes any sense. Okay, because right. What are you gonna say? You it sounds like you go right in the heart of it, and then you bookend it later with the yeah. details. Yeah, yeah. Because okay. if I try and make it perfect, <laughs> I just have to like blah. That's what it is. This is what it's about. Blah. That's what's happening, and then I go and finesse it. Otherwise, it'll. I'll be trying to make it right, and. Um, uh, that's, you know, you just, I just need to try and make it, make it real, not right. It doesn't have to be right, it just needs to be real, if that makes any sense. It does. It sounds like you don't like anything forced. You like it just to just be spontaneous. Yeah, spontaneous is good because that gives your uh, characters room to surprise you. I mean, have an idea what the scene is about, what's the conflict, what do they want, what, what, how is it serving the story. Those things are sort of around in my head. And then I just sort of let the characters have at it and then tweak it a little bit later. I mean, obviously, you know, you want to tweak it f for um, if it's supposed to be funny, you want to make sure that there's some humor in there and all that kind of stuff. But if you just kind of put it all out there, whatever or the kernel of uh, truth or, or organic, you know, thing that's happening in the, in the scene will sort of happen and then you can sort of mold around that. Mm -hmm. And, and cut stuff <laughs> that you know shouldn't be there even if it is funny or even if it is if it's not moving the theme forward you know what's the favorite scene of a film that you are not a part of that you wish you'd written oh, it's so real so great oh lord have mercy <laughs> oh my god favorite scene there's so many uh wow maybe when you were back in college do you remember one that was just like since i know you you like stuff from the 80s like I do, 90s, and it seems like that, it's just a more richer time. Yeah, I mean, there's stuff that immediately comes to mind, like uh, I'm sort of a romantic, so of course I'm gonna go to like When Harry Met Sally, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Cause I'm a romantic, that's why, I can't believe that's what comes to my brain right now. <laughs> Is this the pie scene? Are we going for the pie scene or no? Okay. <laughs> Actually, you know, it, it, well the pie scene is a good one. Um, uh, Oh, God, what's the other one? Uh, about last night. Stuff like that. I mean, because I'm just such a, oh, I'm this, I am a sucky romantic. <laughs> no, that's, I'm like, but of course there's brilliant scenes that of are not coming to me right now at all. One of the, well, okay, here, here if we want to be really, you know, filmmakery, my favorite filmmaker is Krzysztof Kieslowski. He did uh, three colors, red, blue, and white. And, um, uh, just brilliant, right? Brilliant filmmaker. And um, I, my first short film was based, this is actually, my first short film was inspired by uh, Blue, which um, the opening scene is so haunting and, and incredible. If you've never seen, the, I mean, really, it's Juliette Binoche. She's in a car with her uh, husband and child. And it's like this haunting visual way that they show what happens and there's an accident. And ultimately what happens is her whole family dies except for her. So she spends the whole movie grieving but really trying to eliminate any memories of that life because she, it's too painful for her. Right. And so um, that inspired me. It's, it's my first short film is, based, is literally inspired by that. It's about a man who's wife dies and he based he, he's haunted by the memories it's the opposite though he's haunted by the memories so he wants to you know uh, kill himself because he can't deal with all the pain and of the love and all that stuff it actually has a happy ending oh it does oh, good. <laughs> mine has a happy ending Kristoff Kislowski was like whatever <laughs> well, so you've been writing for 20 years what's the common thread in all of the stories that you write um you talked about writing about religion and sex. Yes. And 
Uh, yeah, there's definitely a spiritual element in most of what I write. I'd say spirit, spirituality, love, um, and I definitely have issues with sex. <laughs> oh, okay. We can turn the camera off and talk about those later. But no, yeah. but, but, no I uh -huh. really said uh -huh. that because I work out those issues. When you, it goes back to you saying, is it easier to sort of um, deal with Remember, uh, uh -huh. deal, being truthful in the writing. Being truthful yeah. in your writing. So I actually deal with all of that stuff um, in my writing, like religion and sex and mm -hmm. all of the stuff. It's definitely a theme in several of my screenplays. So I get to sort of deal with it in a real authentic way and, and, it not, and not be me. <laughs> and then uh, without going too deep into it, are we talking sort of like the Madonna whore complex? Oh, and, per and, yeah, and, perfect. And, all and, that. Okay. Yes. So, all of so, that. Yeah, sort, sort of uh, it's keeping so, a good girl good, and so then, yeah. uh -huh. so specifically on point because even in um, one script uh, called what Reflections White, which is part of a trilogy again, trilogy inspired by C Christoph Kislowski, um, it's all about spirituality and sex, and and the archetypes in it are uh, literally they don't have names, but the, the characters are archetypes. There's a, a virgin, mm -hmm. a prostitute, uh, a cop, an angel. And uh, and a lover, <laughs> so I like deal with it really directly right. in that script. Right. Do you almost like what's taboo, and then to try to turn it around and show that it maybe isn't? Yes. Like really show people that we're hiding this stuff, but it's really shouldn't be hidden. I definitely uh, explore explore issues that are taboo, but like you said, shouldn't be taboo. They're taboo, it, but these are just people dealing with stuff that we all deal with, and. Society has at some point said that these things are taboo, but it's not taboo. It's just life. It's just life and things that we all do. And you know, we we love. We uh, we love. We make love. We have you know religion. We have issues about religion. We explore all those different things. We um, go through transformation. We we make mistakes, and some of them are bad and dark and horrible. We somehow uh, hopefully find resolution or absolution, all that stuff. So it's not taboo, it's just life. You know, I consider one of my scripts to be a faith based script, but the faith based world would never consider it a faith based script because, ironically, it has, um, it has uh, sex, in, sex in it and violence in it and stuff like that. But there's this incredible amount of spirituality and even religion and transformation and, and absolution and forgiveness and all the stuff that happens. But because we're a little hypocritical in our ideas about religion, you know, because it has sex and violence in it, they would not consider it a faith-based script, but it totally is. <laughs> have you gotten feedback from people on that? I have. Well, my brother goes, ah. Oh, it's too much. It's too much religion, and he's 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 kind of like an atheist agnostic. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then other people are like, "Oh, it's very spiritual," but even the people who think of it as spiritual understand that our idea of faith-based today means it can't have certain elements. It couldn't possibly be an R-rated film, you know? Right, right. Because you know, because there's no sex and violence in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. You're like, okay. You know, we're what? gonna cut that. <laughs> no, no. I want to keep it in. If you want to keep it in, I want it to be real. I never grew up going to church. That's why I don't. I don't. I don't know. But I, I'm fascinated by religion, and I'm fascinated by. I will listen a lot of times to religious radio shows because I'm very fascinated by the the community that's built around it, and I yeah. know that things that maybe are considered a little taboo that still exist might be very scary. Yeah. to certain populations. I don't know if that's the diplomatic way to put it, but... I mean, I was brought up as a Baptist Christian. Mm -hmm. um, I consider myself uh, uh, spiritual, not religious. Right. But mm -hmm. most of my actual characters that I write about are Catholic. Interesting. <laughs> wow. So then there's a lot of guilt, sounds yes. like, and yeah. then, but maybe, and having to kind of repent and, and thinking that they're bad. And, but then there's a lot of interesting things to look at in that because I think we all feel that even if we're not even doing something that horrible. Yes. I think guilt is, especially as women, we're instilled to feel like we've got to nurture and if we don't, we're bad. It's true, so. yes, but you know, guilt is just a terrible thing. We should just get rid of it. 
And so you write about that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's no room for it. <laughs> There's no room in our happy place for guilt. But it, there is in our scripts, though. <laughs> sure. And it makes for more interesting characters. Absolutely. <laughs> You've sold your first screenplay, and then... You have like 20 more? <laughs> I have about 20 scripts, yeah. Okay. About eight to 10 that I think are ready to be sold or made or something like that. And then I've also written, um, been hired to write. Oh, okay. Yeah. So of those 20, have you sold any more or you've just been hired to write others that were more like spec? Yeah, like I've been hired, paid to write a script for people. So I've, that's happened like six or seven times. And then um, my personal scripts, other than options, which some people are like, well, that's a script sale. But I think of that differently. I think of an option as an option and a script sale as a script sale because an option reverts back to you. You know, they're just paying for the time to try and get it made. So they might pay you five or $10,000 for a year or two years, and you can't really market that script or sell it anywhere. And then if they can't get anything going, then it comes back to you. So I consider that a little bit different, but if you sell your script, you've sold it, that's it, it's done. So of these 20 scripts, how often do you look at them and where do you keep them? Uh, I still have hard copies of a lot of my scripts, like, in some box somewhere in the back of my closet and um but i do have everything or mostly everything on um di i even have some on like the square discs oh wow yeah, floppy that disc? I get, yeah oh, floppy wow. disk that i need to get like <laughs> pulled off of there um i had someone do that because they wanted a script that they knew i had written and i hadn't looked at that script in forever and they were like oh my god but i need the other version <laughs> it's like you mean the one that's on the floppy disk? Right. Uh, do people still get, do you know someone who can get it off? And so yeah. he actually did know um, us, this guy, you know, there are, there's always that guy. There is, yeah. Who has his little thing in the back of somewhere. <laughs> and, and he was able to put the floppy wow. in and transfer it, yeah, and get that script off. I was like, thank you. So, yeah. But they're all, you know, online or sometimes I email them to myself. A friend of mine said, you should always just email your script to yourself so that it'll always be somewhere in cyberspace that you can just dig it up if you need it. When you look at your scripts, is it ever painful? Not because of you were being critical, but you knew where you were at that time in your life and you know what prompted you writing that? Uh, yes, there's definitely scripts that have some, um, I don't know if painful anymore is the right word, but definitely some kind of bittersweet emotion. Mm -hmm. um, there are people, like I definitely have characters that are named after people. Mm -hmm. And um, there are experiences that are in the script that are real in some of them. So I'll think about that and I'll think about that time and I'll think about who I was and all of that. So I'd say bittersweet, not necessarily painful, but definitely bittersweet. Yeah. Right. Well, I know I've heard a lot of authors say that they've written about people they've known and that once that book or ca movie came out that those people never knew it was them because they never saw themselves like that. Oh, that's interesting. You know, I think it was Anne Lamott was made one of the people I heard. There were other writers too that said they just don't recognize themselves. That's interesting. They don't see themselves. Yeah, that's pr that would probably be true, I think, of any of my characters, you know. I don't even recognize myself and, you know, my brother was saying, that's you. I didn't recognize that as myself, even, and I was writing it, and he was like, no, that, but this is the you character, right? Because I thought that there was a little bit of me infused in all the different characters at that time, and he was like, yeah, but this one's you. <laughs> and I said, wow, oh, right, it is me. <laughs> He's like, that's why you can't be real with, uh, about her. <laughs> I get the sense that you like stories that they kind of push the envelope and they're a little different, but have you ever written something where you wrote it specifically to be commercial because you knew it would sell? Yes, mm -hmm. actually I have written, I wrote a couple of scripts specifically to be commercial, uh, but it also, strangely enough, was pushing the envelope, but, uh, but I really wrote it to be commercial. It's a script called Memoirs of a Virgin Whore. Nice. Ah, there's that theme <laughs> There's that theme again, yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, 
I wrote it because I thought that I, I did think it was a great exploration of religion and sex and the um, idea of how religion impacts our sexuality and all this kind of stuff. So, but I but I thought it would be really really commercial. And it's funny because at the time, it was a little too risque. It was commercial. Like my my manager loved it. He thought it was really commercial. And this is going to sound so weird. It is the script that got me into the Disney Fellowship. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, really? This script? But you know, Disney is like a big conglomerate of like Buena Vista Pictures and all. So it's not just Disney. That's just the name. Sure. <laughs> sure. Right, right. I was like, yes. I got into the Disney Fellowship with the Memoirs of a Virgin Heart. <laughs> so, but... um. Uh, yes. So uh, your question. Push the oh, so did you did you write something to be specifically commercial? And how did you feel about going for that market, knowing that you do like things that are really that, that expose a lot of truths about people that maybe some of the commercial stuff is they can't handle that. Yeah. Um, it's t it was tough for me to write something that was that I thought was just commercial. I. Um, when I was in the fellowship, I pitched an idea. I, I actually pitched three ideas. There were two that I really wanted to do. I should have just pitched the one that I really wanted to write. But I knew I had to pitch something commercial. So I pitched this idea that I did not want to write, but, but I knew was extremely commercial. And they went for it. And so that is the script that I wrote while I was in the Disney fellowship for them. It has never seen, I've never shown it to anyone other than them. I had to show it to them. Right. But, and it's not like it's the worst script in the world, but I'm very, very critical, and I don't think it represents me, right? I don't think it represents what I'm about, my voice, nothing. It was very, very commercial, and um, I was just like, yeah, I can't. My manager was like, this is a great idea, it's so commercial, please show me that script. And I was like, no, you'll never see it. <laughs> Sorry, I can't. I can't have my no, <laughs> no. So, if you're critical of something that you've done, can you go back and change it? Or once you know this is not what I want, you walk away. Well, I can go back and change. I actually gave that concept, that script idea, to someone else and said, "You can put your name on it, so you you can tweak it, but you've got to make it better than just the commercial." crap that it is right now. And if you do that, then we can go out with it. Otherwise, I just can't. It's just, ugh, I need more. <laughs> I needed to be saying more. I needed to be doing more. So. so without getting into too many of the details about why, what was it about the story or the character that you didn't like? Or what um, was that not? I like? created a very stereotypical commercial script. Hmm. Um, essentially, it was like Robin Hood in the hood. Okay, <laughs> I was just like, this is terrible. This is so bad. But it was super commercial. At the time, it was the kind of movies that probably they would make or whatever. And I was like, but I don't want them to make it. I don't want them to make it. It's terrible. It's awful. I want them to make it. <laughs> so there was no truth in it. You just felt it was all stereotype. It was all what people there wanted to see. There might have been some little shit. Because it's, you know, it's Robin Hood. So it's whatever that is. But... Yeah, yeah. I did not feel that it was authentic. Mm -hmm. It wasn't how what I. Yeah, I couldn't. You couldn't. Yeah, it wasn't true. Yeah, enough. It wasn't truthful. I'll, I'll just go with that. It wasn't truthful. It was just very marketable and commercial. And aside from your agent, did other people say you should you should do this? Oh yeah, there were a couple of people who wanted to read it. I just. I want my best work to be to reflect me, and I want to put out stuff that I want to see, that I want to see. Hmm. And um, I felt like, which is why I wrote memoirs. I felt I, I can be commercial, but it still has to be real and authentic and represent me and my voice. I don't just want to put anything out there. And and actually, I had an agent at the time. Uh, um, an ICM agent, and she wanted me to write more of stuff in that realm. She never saw that script, but she knew about it. Huh. <laughs> she was like, can you write more of, and I was like, I'm never gonna write more of that. Wow. And um, what actually attracted her to, to me was the memoirs huh. of a virgin whore. And I was like, but this is why you signed me. Why are you trying to get me to write this other stuff? This is why you signed me, because you liked this script, which is my voice. 
why are you trying to get me to write this other stuff, which is not me? And the answer was? Um, Because she thought she could sell it. Hmm. So, I mean, and she's not a bad person. She's just an no, agent. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And so, you know, we, we ended up parting ways. Yeah. Um, you know, you have to make a choice sometimes. Uh, and there is a line. I mean, you can balance it out. You can still be commercial and real and all that kind of stuff. But there is right. a line. You know, you have to sort of finesse that oh, line. Yeah. Like Juno. Yeah. I would say that's something that pushes the envelope, but then it's commercial and enough. And it's commercial. You know, yeah. because she's a likable character. Mm -hmm. You want to see her win. Yes. And she's not, you know. I mean, and there's that other thing. I mean, with minorities, mm -hmm. you know, there is, I don't even know if we'd call it a burden or whatever, but there is that thing where yeah, images matter. Yeah. How, you know, and, you know, I feel like you do have some responsibility for what you, not that um, there's something for everyone, but especially at that time, there wasn't enough other stuff right. to be putting that out there. We needed, we're trying to grow, you know. I mean, everyone has stereotypes, you know. You know, white people from Indiana have stereotypes, yeah. you know. And yeah. LA. Right, <laughs> LA has, it's like, yeah. it's, it's not like they don't exist and we can't put them on film, but I think when you're um, a, a person of color or even a woman, you know, to a certain degree, there's a little a balance that really has to be struck until there's enough of the other stuff out there. You know, when there's enough stuff, then you can put that other stuff and we can laugh at it. Sure. But when there's not enough of that stuff, then that's what people think it is. So you don't want to be contributing to that, right? Interesting. Okay. But I did know it was commercial. <laughs> so right. I was like, you want me to, this is commercial, yeah? Okay. And I know that's what you, and I was like, no, but I don't like it. Sure. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and let's say for like Legally Blonde, that's definitely right. a stereotype there you go. that's acceptable. Um, and but you st and she's quirky, but she's still commercial enough where right. she's not that. Evil. And she had a twist because on the surface she seemed a certain way, right? But we also saw that she had um, a bottom and levels, and she was actually super smart, right? And right. had a soul. Sure, but people only saw her as like this doll, right? Sort of, yeah. Exactly. Well, Tamika, forgive me. I don't know too much about the option process, so I think. You've said before that the option process is just the right to sort of not take up your time, but work with you and tie up the script. That's yeah, the but they don't even always, when you get an option, it's almost, I guess the best way to say it, it's like selling your script for a period of time. So you're, they're optioning it with the right to completely purchase it. So usually when there's an option, um, it's let's say 5000 or $10,000 for a year or two and, they, and you can't do anything with that script during that time and you're not necessarily working with them either. You're just saying go off, do whatever you want to do and if you get the money for this script then you guys have already agreed how much you're going to be paid for that script. So let's say you're going to be paid $100,000 for the script and the option is $10,000. Well, that's $10,000 against the price of the sale of the script. So when the script actually sells, you'll get 90 because you already got 10. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, let's say uh, a year, the option expires in, in a year or two years or whatever it is, and they can't, um, they haven't been able to get the money for it or get it set up or packaged or anything, and they don't really want to work with it anymore because they feel like they can't, then the script rights revert back to you. So then you can do whatever you want to do with it or someone else can do what they want to do with it. As opposed to someone saying, no, I love this. Um, I believe, I just want to buy it outright. So when you're contacted about optioning a script, is that something that you've already initiated or you, you've obviously put it out somewhere where people are seeing it, you can shop it around. Where is that place? Um, usually uh, as far as an option, it can happen a lot of different ways. Like you can meet someone and tell them about your story or your script and they are super interested and then they want to read the script and then they decide to option it. Or you can be super proactive and um, find some production companies that are looking for material and um, have your manager or, or somebody uh, submit a letter or an email letter, an email and um, see if they'll read it. And you know, it's like usually you're sending like a synopsis or a one-liner or something like that. And then if they do, they might decide to option it. Um, there's still the contest route. I mean, there are a lot of amazing contests out there that 
literally um, start careers. I mean, the most famous one is the Nichols Fellowship. Um, that's like $25,000 and a lot of publicity. It's the most prestigious screenwriting award you can get. Yeah. Then, of course, the Sundance Lab, which nurtures your project and nurtures you and really helps as much as they can help you to take it to the next level and maybe get it made. Um, there's no money in that one, but there is a lot of prestige. And, and uh, they, you know, they mother hen you a little bit, so that's great. That's nice. And then um, uh, there's, uh, there's a few others out there that have like a decent money prize connected to it. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a really great way for your manager or agent or somebody like that to sort of platform somebody to read your stuff. Anything do's and don'ts. Let's suppose you know someone that's getting something optioned the first time. Mm -hmm. Any any things that they just need to be aware of that they might not. Yeah, I would say really be aware of the fine print. Sometimes um, there'll be something in the option where they can just automatically option your script again for another year. Oh. And I would make sure that that's not in there. And if it is, make sure that it's in there but with a price tag right. on it mm -hmm. for another 2500 or something like that. Um, and uh, make sure that um, you're getting everything. Some people will just say, well, I just want, let's just keep it simple, make it a one page, just the option for this. But really with an option, you should get as many details in that option as possible. So if you want to be a producer or if you want a certain credit, you should have all of that stuff in your option because if they do you know, um, get the money or whatever, the negotiations become different. So this is when you have your power. At the option level is when you have your power. You can say, well, okay, you, I want an associate producer credit. So you need to put that in the option when you get your money that I'm still going to get my associate producer credit because then that's something that they have to deal with when they're out there in the world. Ah, uh, you know? okay. If it is a deal breaker for you to be the director, then you need to tell them that right up front, and it needs to be part of, you know, your, yeah, it just needs to be, you know, if it's a deal breaker. It doesn't have to be, <laughs> but if it is, you know. And do you have a lawyer look this over, or if you have a trusted friend? I mean, if you have a really good manager, uh -huh. they often serve as the kind of lawyer okay. person. I, a really good manager has the skills to look at a contract like that and know what should and shouldn't be in it. Right. Um, it's great if you have a lawyer, but I wouldn't spend money to have a lawyer do it. No. You should okay. have your manager really you know, do that, and hopefully th it's a good manager and they can protect you in that way. Right. Yeah. So now when they go back to option something a second and third time, it's pretty much the same deal, but you're getting, if, if this is part of the agreement, you're getting that extra chunk of money and then it locked up. Yeah, and them. sometimes it can be more. Like, oh. I've definitely gotten more money because they're keeping it for a long, I'm like, well, you've had this for a year. You couldn't get anything going with it. So if I'm going to have my project locked up, then you need to give me a little bit more money for another year. So you can sort of up the ante a bit. And, and they'll go for it, especially if they really feel passionate about it and like they might be close. So then if they decide to actually go ahead with it, then whatever the option money you were paid is then taken out of that final check. Usually it's taken out of the final right, check. Okay. So you know if somebody really believes that they're close and really believes in the script and they're like, okay, I've had it for a year, I just need one more year, I'm right there. They shouldn't have any problems with just go ahead and paying a little extra because it's going to come out of the check anyway. Sure, sure. They're not losing anything. <laughs> you know? oh, right. It's the same deal. You're just taking, I'm just getting some of my money now versus later, now that you think that you're going to sell the script. And so if they decide then, let's suppose they've optioned it three times, they're going to pass. Mm -hmm. So now the rights revert back to you and you own it again? And you own it again. Okay, but you've kept that money. And you keep, and you keep the money. Keep the money, yeah. wow. okay. So it's not a bad deal. No. You know, I actually have, uh, you know, drive by the door I say is like, I made the most money for a script that was never made into a movie. I probably made about uh, $70,000, $75,000 wow. over uh, a period of time of a jar by the door in contests and options and all that stuff. And, um, and, it, <laughs> and, wow. and I still would love to make it into a movie. So, yeah. <laughs> but it's also spawned something else. But it's so. spawned something else. Mm -hmm. So, hey, I'll take that trade off. Has the screenwriting market changed over the course of your writing career? I mean. uh, the screenwriting market has definitely changed. Um, people don't really buy 
treatments anymore like they used to. They really want the whole script and they don't pay as much as they used to. The sales are different. Like I, there are definitely those times when people get, you've heard of a million dollars for a script or whatever. I don't, you don't hear those stories anymore. Um, maybe we'll hear them again in the future, I don't know, but you really don't hear those stories anymore. And also, um, it's changed because screenwriters, I think, have gotten more independent in their spirit and their thoughts about things. So um, screenwriters now want a part of the pie in a different way. They want to be producers on it or somehow be connected to it other than just selling the script and being gone. They don't really want to do that anymore. It used to be you could just sell your script and you're not even invited to the set. <laughs> you know, you could come to the premiere. But, you know, I think a lot of writers want to be more involved in the entire process. Maybe I'm wrong with that, but I don't think so. And maybe it's because I'm in the indie world a lot. So there's a lot of auteurs, you know, writer directors, writer producers, right. you know, or maybe that's just the way that you get your movie made as a writer. You have to find a producer and help find elements to make it happen, okay. you know. Interesting. Right, rather than just being this like, and then you read about it in the Some trades huge, and yeah, yeah, Shane Black or this right. person. Right. If you are connected in that way, then sometimes it can happen. Um, I know some screenwriters, like some actors, transition into screenwriting. There's like a lot of ways that different things happen now, and there's definitely screen TV writers who become, you know, film writers. You know, I think J.J. Abrams started out in television, or did he start? I think he did st start out in TV, transitioned to film, but still does amazing TV and film now. So he, you know, there's just a lot of different ways. Okay. And then lastly, I think you talked about I how it's harder. You think it's harder though, the today because because there's so many people doing it, right? There's so many people doing it. It's harder, but maybe there's a lot more possibility because there's so many different um, mediums and there's so many different channels, and people really actually do need product and material. So it's it's a catch twenty two and a little. It's a ba it balances itself out. There's more opportunities and possibilities in a certain way but it's still harder to really break in to have a solid, solid, solid career, if that makes any sense. It does. I mean, I, I can think of people that I've known that have done commercials right. years ago, and they made more money, and they were sort of that person, and then now it's so flooded, and the money is not the same. It's not the same, it's, right. It's, you know, a buyout or something. And, um, and and that's the thing about being now. It's like this, you know, the, the infamous, you know, the gatekeeper. The walls are down from the gatekeepers and right. all that. And so now everyone's doing it. And the good part is that it's accessible to everyone. The bad part is everybody's doing it. And right. So it's too right. competitive. But lastly, you talked about starting the script is part of the difficult process. Is it? Do you like the middle part, or is finishing actually the the best part about writing? Because you feel the sense of completion. You've seen your character go through these different arcs. You feel like th this is a, a, a living entity. And I think the best part of writing a script is when you actually, you've actually written enough of the beginning, the middle, and the end that you st have visualized the whole entire puzzle in a certain way. So now you're just along for the ride, and it's not, it's not like painful and hard and trying to figure anything out. You've figured it out. Now it's just like, I'm gonna sit down and write this scene, or I'm gonna put that scene, I'm gonna put this scene here, I'm gonna put this scene here, because I think of screenwriting like a puzzle. I very rarely write in chronicle, chronological order. I will literally write a scene that I know is gonna be in the movie. I might write the ending. I mean, I literally, and then I'll start moving, oh, oh no, the scene goes here, the scene goes here. Now some people do that with um, index cards, like they'll write, Put, put the thing together with index cards. I just do it in the script. I just cut and paste and put that scene there and I'll like write a scene and then just go more, 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 knowing that I'm gonna write more scenes there, but knowing that I needed to write that scene. So I think once you have actually, um, I guess, it's a confidence thing. Once you're confident that you know the story and the characters and they're going to, you know, 
it's it's like hey um i can see vegas we're gonna get there it's right there i see the lights and everything i'm in barstow i'm uh, right i'm in by <laughs> there it is right that's like the most exciting uh -huh. part there's a little bittersweet thing it's great to finish like yes of course you love to finish but there's a little bittersweet thing to finishing it's sort of like finishing a good book you're like oh my god it's over right now what am i gonna do Okay. Is there more than it, no? It's over. It's over. <laughs> you know, right, like it's right. done. So there's a little bit of uh, something that you know, and, and I think people feel that when they read a really good book, yeah. and they're just like, "Wow, do I? I'm not going to see those characters again, and that was amazing, and but it's done." Yeah, there's like a there's a loneliness there. So. so when you began writing, did you try to do it in chronological order and then you found that there were different times when you meant to write down a certain scene, you really had a lot of passion for it and you didn't, it affected it later? Um, I think my first script, because I, it came in a certain way, I did try and write it in chronological order, but what was great about it was, you know, this was back in the 90s where ensemble you know, pieces were amazing. Everyone loved them. Now it's like, oh, that's dated. <laughs> <laughs> that's crash like. <laughs> like seriously, <laughs> I still like those. Yeah, crash wasn't that long ago. <laughs> and, but the great thing about those is they're kind of vignette in a way. So you got four or five different stories. So you, it's easy to just go from one story to the next, one story to the next. That was actually what was really great about Drive by the Door for me as a first time writer. It might have been daunting to write 190, 120 pages if I thought of it like that, but I didn't think of it like that. I just thought of it as these different, it was like eight different stories that I was working on. And if I, and um, I was like the audience. When I got kind of tired or whatever of writing that story, I went to another story, so it organically or rhythmically worked for the audience too, because right when it's time to move to the next story, I would just move to the next story, because I organically did it anyway. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm good with that for now. I'm going to go to this one, and then come back to it at the right time when I miss those characters. And then when you were editing, then you were able to tie those eight? Tie them all together. Oh, interesting. Yeah.